For what purpose does the gentleman from Orange, Representative Meyer, rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to speak on the conference report. The gentleman is recognized to debate the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of this body, I uh, respect and appreciate the hard work of the House Education Chairs uh, to negotiate with the Senate leaders on education provisions. I know that we have often squared off against the Senate and had differences, and I know that that was true in this budget, uh, and yet here we are. Unfortunately, this conference budget still has too many education problems to support. The top line numbers for the education budget sound great. Some teachers will get a raise, but don't let that cover up the problems that this budget creates down the hallway in the same school. Since the Republican majority took over in 2010, there have been massive changes to our education system. Some good, some bad, but the net effect has been to undermine the confidence of parents and teachers in our education system, and this budget will not help. Let me be frank. There are those who believe that this General Assembly is out to intentionally harm schools, to damage our system of public education, to replace our public investment in building the American dream with a privatized system that separates and divides us by race and class. When people share these fears with me, I tell them that there's lots of education work done here that is bipartisan, that I believe most of my colleagues of both parties want us to have a strong public school for every child. But this budget will do nothing to calm the fears of teacher and parents who love our public schools, but are struggling to maintain their investment in them. Let's start with salaries. Again, a Republican budget shortchanges teachers. Governor Cooper proposed giving teachers the largest pay raise in a decade without having to raise taxes. The governor's budget recommended $540 million investment in teacher salaries, and this budget provides only two thirds of that amount. The lowest raise that Governor Cooper proposed was more than 7%. But in this budget, there are teachers who get close to 0%. Teachers on 11 steps of the salary schedule get less than 1% raise. The governor's budget proposed- Mr. Speaker. Raise for what purpose does the gentleman from Wake, Representative Dollar Rice? See if the gentleman from Orange would yield for a question. Does the gentleman from Orange yield to the gentleman from Wake? I do not at this time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman does not yield. The gentleman from Orange continues to have the floor to debate the bill. The governor's budget proposed raising starting teacher salaries by 8.6 percent, but this budget offers them nothing. Representative Dollar commonly starts his questions as he was probably about to start me by asking, are you aware? Well, are you aware, members, that state employees are going to have a health insurance premium increase next year of $25 to $50 a month? That's $300 to $600 a year. Members enrolled in the Consumer Directed Health Plan are going to have a $2,819 increase, possibly, along with losing their $1,500 health savings account that may cost them a total of $5,219 if they're on the family plan. The raises in this budget will leave many of those teachers and state employees behind. Many educators believe that the General Assembly is especially hostile to veteran educators. They believe that Republican leaders are trying to drive veteran teachers out of the classroom in order to replace them with younger, cheaper teachers, no matter the impact on student learning. This budget does nothing to allay those fears. Teachers with more than 25 years of experience see a minuscule 0.6% raise over the two years of the budget. That's just $30 a month. Governor Cooper proposed giving them an average of $350 more per month. This budget provides some veteran teachers with bonuses, but that amount does not count towards their retirement. This budget places an increasing reliance on bonuses to keep teachers in the classroom. There's about $50 million for bonuses in the budget, all targeted to specific groups of teachers, with some teachers eligible for no bonuses at all. Just about every teacher will tell you that although bonuses might help individual teachers, they won't work for keeping teachers in the classroom. The Republican philosophy seems to think that teachers will respond to bonuses as an incentive, but there is extensive research that the only kind of bonus that works in education are school-wide bonuses that encourage teachers to work as a team. When it comes to salary, teachers value fairness above all else. They know that schools work as ecosystems and that every teacher plays a role in the overall educational success of every child. 
Rewarding one teacher with a performance bonus literally means that they are getting paid extra for credit that should be shared with their colleagues. The new math and reading bonus program rewards teachers for growth, and we want growth. But offering this bonus to, for teachers, to teachers in the top 25% of performance, rather than teachers who meet a certain growth benchmark, is not so much an incentive to teach better as it is an incentive to teach the kids who are the most likely to grow. For many teachers, this is going to be a disincentive to take on difficult teaching assignments. If we're going to do bonuses, there's a better way to do it, but I would guess that most teachers would prefer the $50 million in bonuses from this budget be spent on an across-the-board raise instead. But what bewilders me most about the teacher pay raise plan in this conference budget report is the bizarre plan to give teachers no raise from the time they hit year 15 until they get to year 25. Can you defend the idea that any teacher should go 10 years without a step pay increase? When my wife hit year 15 on the pay scale, we had just had our third child, and I'm sure that many teachers are in their childbearing years during this range. Do we think that teachers are going to stay in the profession if their family expenses are increasing, but their income will not increase for 10 years? Enough about salaries. Let's look at some of the other education elements of this budget. Classrooms and the children in them continue to suffer. Per-pupil spending, when adjusted for inflation, is 6.7% below what it was 10 years ago. Next year, textbook and digital supply funding will be 27% of what it was 10 years ago. Implementing the state's approved digital learning plan is estimated to cost $290 million, but this year's budget only provides $6.4 million, 2% of the recommended budget. We had a very public fight earlier this year about class sizes. A previous budget's ill-conceived class size requirement was going to result in hundreds of teacher layoffs and would have placed thousands of students into modular classrooms. We all heard from parents scared of their children losing access to arts, music, and PE classes. We negotiated a one-year reprieve, and we were promised that money would be budgeted for these classes, but there is no money in this budget. And these classes are called enhancements, when most of us consider them to be a fundamental part of what children should be learning in school. Another thing that's not in this bill is any specific funding for our 480 low-performing schools. How we continue to completely neglect our most struggling students is completely beyond me. The General Assembly continues to be particularly hard on school administration. This budget would bring central office spending down to 83.9 million. Do you know what central office spending was in 1996-97? It was 84.1 million. That's 20 years ago. Can we afford to spend less on any portion of education than what we spent 20 years ago? This cut has been described to target our large urban districts who have large central office staffs, but that's not who's going to suffer. Our biggest districts pay for most of their central staff with local funding. On the other hand, this cut will be particularly difficult to swallow for small rural districts that have to meet all the new reporting requirements in this budget. Over the last 10 years, the Department of Public Instruction has lost 197 state paid positions. That's 31% of its workforce. This budget cuts the agency by an additional 18%, yet the budget also creates 24 new reporting requirements for the department. How in the world are they supposed to meet these new expectations? The only major agency activity not statutorily required by state or federal law is the agency's support for low-performing schools. Is this where they're supposed to take their cuts? That's horrible governance. It's bad for schools and bad for children. There's also a bizarre provision that calls for an audit of the Department of Public Instruction. The budget says we will spend $1 million for this audit, and it will find $1 million in savings. I guess I should have been a school auditor rather than a school social worker. Can anyone tell me why this audit will cost this much? What is it supposed to do? Why can't the state's existing auditor do it? And why in the world do we assume that they will find $1 million in savings when, this, when DPI has already been cut and cut and cut? Who does get new funding at DPI? There are actually 14.65 new positions, even though none of them were requested by the State Board of Education. The Superintendent of Public Instruction gets 10 positions. 
We don't know what these staff people will do. We don't know why the superintendent needs personal staff when he already has a whole department working for him. We just know the superintendent gets a posse. In the meantime, some of these positions will be created by laying off four current state employees. They can go look for help from the worst unemployment program in the country. Why are we doing these things? Who are we listening to when we set our education priorities? Certainly not teachers, not even the State Board of Education. There are 31 new non-salary spending items in the budget. Only three of them appear to be related to the State Board's budget request, and none of those three were fully funded. And this is a State Board of Education that was appointed by this Republican-controlled General Assembly. Who's going to be accountable for seeing whether this hodgepodge of bad ideas works? There are about 20 new reporting requirements in this budget that are supposed to go to the Legislative Education Oversight Committee. Can anyone tell me how many times the Ed Oversight Committee met over the last biennium? If you don't remember how many, that might be because the answer Representative is that it Meyer, didn't meet at all. Suspend. Members, there's a lot of conversations going. Would ask members to please preserve decorum. The gentleman has the floor to continue to debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have a chance to dramatically change the way that we use our school grading scale. The current system that relies on a mixture of 80% achievement scores and 20% growth is basically an expensive way to identify where poor students go to school. This House has tried on multiple times to adjust our school grades, but this budget doubles down on the 80-20 split. The federal government's new Every Student Succeeds Act requires us to adjust the way we do school grading. It's an opportunity to dramatically rethink our approach. But this budget has a policy provision that keeps as close as possible to the current practice. And if that's not enough to make the public believe that this body wants to undermine public schools, there's also the dramatic expansion of spending on private schools. The budget puts the existing voucher program into the base budget. It will automatically get up to $10 million a year added over the next few years, even, even though our public school per pupil spending has to be approved every single year. And while we know our public schools have hundreds of millions of dollars in needs, the voucher program didn't even spend all of the money in its existing budget this year. Meanwhile, recent evaluations of voucher programs in Louisiana, Indiana, Washington, D.C., and Ohio have all shown negative effects, including a review in Louisiana that uh, Martin West of Harvard University said had the worst effects of any review of educational programs he'd seen in the li literature, not just compared with other voucher programs, but in the history of education research. On top of that, this budget introduces the new concept of educational savings accounts. Some parents are eligible for $9,000 a year on a debit card that they can use for private educational expenses. This is on top of the $2,400 voucher amount and the $8,000 in vouchers for children with disabilities. This in other states, this type of program has been found to expand opportunities for fraud, to cost more to administer than traditional voucher programs, and to divert funding from public school programs for disabled students. Then there's the pork. We say that education spending is nonpartisan, but apparently some partisans benefit more than others. Nine new pass-through grants to nonprofits, all made without any committee hearings or review process. There's one sole source contract for something described as a life-changing experiences school pilot program. What is that? What description does it have? It's a traveling, three-dimensional, interactive, holistic, and evidence-based multimedia in-school program. What the heck is that? <laughs> Budgets represent a philosophy of governance. Our state has lost faith in this body's ability to govern public schools. This budget does nothing to belie that. I cannot vote for the budget, and I encourage you to vote against it. Mr. Speaker. Support of public schools.